This is, um, I think, going to be a very interesting uh, session in that it's addressing a very important aspect uh, in Ireland and in Irish surgery, which is um, the issue about non-training scheme doctors in Ireland, uh, current status and future recommendations. What happened uh, last year was that the President and the Council of the Royal College of Surgeons decided to set up a, a short-life working group to look into this matter uh, further. And we'd like to present, this is the first time, in fact, that we're presenting the data to you today. I guess this slide just makes one point, um, and, and that is that these doctors play a huge and a very important role in looking after surgical patients in Ireland. If you look at the total number of non-training, uh, non-consultant hospital doctors in Ireland, uh, over 1,000, and that 64% of these are not in one of our training schemes. Uh, and this is certainly the case in our Model 4 hospitals, but even more in Model 3 hospitals. So the, the, the mission of our Short Life Working Group really was to look at recommendations and how we can better support these non-training scheme doctors. We want to support these doctors to enhance their clinical skills, their knowledge, and to support them with their career development. Our work is now complete. Uh, the document will be published in the next couple of months, and today is the first time that we outline the work of this group uh, and present its findings. Uh, we had a phased approach uh, to this project. We established a, a membership of the Short Life Working Group. We looked at the demographics of, of these doctors in Ireland. Uh, we then asked the doctors what they thought. Uh, and we won't spend too much time on that, on that today, but that was a very detailed audit which will be in the report. On the basis of that, we set up a series of work streams to interrogate that audit uh, database and then came up with recommendations. And these work streams really are what we're going to present today. The first is kind of a legal work stream. What are the legal aspects of these doctors coming to Ireland? What is their career pathway? What about continuing professional development? And finally, what is their uh, quality of life? So the session today <clears throat> is designed to address these issues with you. And I think what I'd like um, uh, you to do when you're listening to the speakers is to think about one of these doctors coming to Ireland. So the doctor that's going to the surgeon is going to join your hospital in July. The first issue is what is the current legal status um, um, for these doctors coming to Ireland? What are the obstacles? The second is when they're in, what's their career pathway? What are their opportunities? What are their expectations? The third section is to look at how we can develop them with their, with their career. Uh, the fourth is to look at uh, quality of life issues for these doctors, which is tremendously important. That was a very important work stream. And, and finally, delighted to welcome uh, Mike Griffith from the Edinburgh College, who's going to tell us how things happen across the way. Okay, so without any further ado, I'd like to ask our first uh, speaker uh, to come up. And our first speaker is uh, Judge Peter Kelly who has sorted this out on all of the legal aspects of this, uh, of, of this project, who is the uh, 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 past president of the High Court of Ireland. So, Peter, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the 16th of December last, Mr. Varadkar, the Thornishta Deputy Prime Minister, answered a parliamentary question concerning the lot of non-European doctors and their inability to find places on a training scheme. And this is what he said. Non-European doctors make an enormous contribution to the Irish Health Service. They have been doing service jobs in hospitals throughout the country for decades. They've also done a phenomenal job during the pandemic. Non-European doctors are not always treated very well in our system. It is hard for them to get consultant posts or to get on specialist training schemes. The Minister for Health and I are working on it and will change it. And I'm going to pause there and I'll come back to the remainder of the quotation at the end of my contribution. But there on the parliamentary record is a clear acknowledgement 
of the difficulties that are encountered by non-European doctors in their endeavours to come here, to find a career here, and to get on to a specialist training course. And over the course of the next few minutes, I hope to outline to you, and it is an outline, uh, outline to you the hurdles that they have to surmount and the conditions that they have to fulfill. So could I invite you over the next few minutes to picture yourself in your mind's eye as just such a doctor, living perhaps in India or Pakistan or Sudan, but in any event, many time zones away from Ireland and having to deal with all the regulatory requirements. And so we begin the journey. And the first thing that the doctor has to do is to seek registration on the medical register maintained by the Medical Council. And this is, for the most part, an online process. And it's fair to say that the website is extremely user-friendly and easy to operate. The first thing the doctor has to do is to decide onto which element of the register he or she seeks to be registered. And there are four divisions on the register, only two of which are of any relevance to us today. The first is the general register division, and the second is the trainee division. And in reality, it's only the general division that's going to be of any interest to such an applicant. And he will be invited then to indicate where he or she qualified. And if you are a graduate of a recognized medical school, then you can proceed to seek registration. If you are not, then forget about it. For all practical purposes, it's a non-starter. But the Medical Council will be concerned not merely with where you graduated, but where you were trained subsequent to graduation. And if you had that training in an area that's recognized by them, in a school or in a hospital recognized by them, you can proceed to registration. If not, then you may have to engage in what is called the PRES, a pre-registration exam system, in order to obtain registration on the general division of the register. This is probably the easiest part of the task that has to be undertaken by the prospective uh, junior doctor coming to work in Ireland. So let's assume the registration process is at an end and we now move into what is a multi-step process where the doctor is going to have to encounter two government departments, one of them on two occasions, the prospective employer and the health service executive. So he has to apply, or she has to apply, for an immigration visa from the Department of Justice. And this is usually coupled with an application being made for a work permit. That has to be obtained from the Department of Enterprise, but the doctor is not the applicant for that. That has to be done by the prospective employer. So insofar as the doctor is maintaining any control over the process, he or she loses it at this stage and it's over to the employer to promote this application. And work permits come in one of two types, either a general work permit or a critical skills work permit. And it's hardly surprising, given the extent to which we are so dependent upon these doctors, that critical skills permits may be obtained, but there's always a snag, isn't there? And the snag is you can't get a critical skills permit unless you have a two-year contract of employment, and most of these doctors have a six-month contract of employment. So although the facility is there, it can't be utilised. But there are some changes, and I'll come to them at the conclusion of my contribution. So in addition to that, you now have your visa and you've got your permit, you hope, and you're dependent, as I say, on your prospective employer in that regard. So you arrive in Ireland, and you then have to present yourself to the Immigration Service of the Department of Justice there to obtain a permit, which takes the form of a stamp which is affixed to your visa. And there are different types of stamps, and the ones that have usually been encountered by doctors are a stamp which permits you to reside in the country for the currency of your employment, which is usually six months. And at the end of that six months, if you have another six-month contract, you have to go back and present yourself again to get another permit and pay a not insubstantial fee. And that has to happen throughout each of the six-month contracts. 
That is also the subject of change, and I'll address that in due course. But this is the state of play at the time when this work group uh, ceased its operations. The developments that have occurred have taken place after that. And finally, then, there is a language competence, which is a matter, very properly, of concern to the authorities. And you are presumed to be competent in English if you have graduated in certain medical schools which are identified. They would all be medical schools where the teaching would have been done through English and generally in English-speaking countries. Uh, if you don't have such a qualification, then you must do uh, an English language test and notify the results of that to the relevant authorities. So now you've obtained your visa, you have your work permit, you've got your stamp on your visa, and your language competence is not in doubt, so you come and you work. And you hope to proceed to an RCSI training scheme place. Two condition precedents have to be met before you can even contemplate applying for that. You have to be registered on the trainee division of the medical register. And whilst there used to be difficulty in transferring from the general to the trainee, that is no longer so. It's now very easy indeed to transfer from one to the other. And secondly, you have to demonstrate competence in English. There is an annual selection process for core surgical training. And the selection is based on clinical and academic achievement, interview performance and general suitability. And in the report prepared by the legal work stream, which is an appendix to the general report, all of that is set out in some detail. And the object of the exercise is to have a form of application which demonstrates equity of access, objectivity in the process of selection, and transparency in appointments. And so there are marks allotted under a whole series of different headings, and at the end of that process, an order of merit is achieved. Now, the fact that you have made the grade, that you've got the relevant pass mark, is no guarantee of success. First of all, because of the limited numbers that are available on the course. Secondly, and this is a matter of major concern, and understandably so, the question of nationality arises. And to date, there has been a preference given to Irish and EU nationals over non-such nationals. And that, of course, has been a major cause of concern and distress on the part of candidates. And the way in which that worked was that if you were a non-EU national, even though you might have obtained first place, you went to the back of the queue because of your nationality. So let us say, for example, there are 80 places available and 90 candidates have been successful in obtaining the pass mark or better. And you were a stellar performer and you got first place, but you're a non-EU national and the 80 who are successful after you are all either Irish or EU nationals, then you go down to 81st place and you don't get a place. And that, of course, is a clear discrimination, but it was a discrimination which was part of government policy. And curiously enough, the statutory basis justifying it was a provision of the Employment Equality Act. So it just goes to show when you let the lawyers loose, the Employment Equality Act was used as the basis for the discrimination. Recent developments. Sunday tweet. What's all that about? Well, at 9.34 a.m. on Sunday the 26th of September of 2021, the Minister for Health tweeted, and this is what he said, happy to announce that we are opening up our commitment for specialist pathway to all doctors working in our health service and ending our existing policy of giving EU citizens preferential access to postgraduate training places. So opening up our consultant and specialist pathway. This is, of course, the polar opposite of the policy that has been pursued for so many years, and it's announced on the Sunday morning. And I'm sure it gave rise to a good deal of jubilation on the part of those affected. But sadly, tweets even ministerial tweets are not legislative instruments 
and they're not self-executing ordinances, and indeed, if they were, why would we have had the parliamentary question posed in December of that year, last year, part of the answer to which I've already drawn to your attention. I'm now going to turn to the remainder of that answer, where having indicated an acceptance of the unfairness of the situation, the Thornish that went on to say, we've already changed the system to allow for a two-year work permit, so a doctor does not need to change the work permit every time he changes his hospital job every six months or so. So that change, so as to permit of a two-year permit, apparently has already been brought about. In addition, he said, we are going to offer stamp four visas to non-EU doctors who have been in the country for two years. This will allow the doctor to qualify for consideration on the course on the same basis as an Irish and EU doctor. So this means that instead of having to be in the country for five years in order to get a stamp for on your visa, you will now be able to do it apparently after two years. And once you have the stamp for visa, you will be treated to all intents and purposes as being in the same category as an Irish or EU national. And this is a work in progress. The minister said that he was hoping to implement that in a matter of weeks. Um, so it's going to happen, or perhaps it is happening even as we speak, but it should bring to an end a major cause of complaint on the part of non-EU doctors about the inequity with which they were visited when they sought to obtain a place on a training scheme. So there were two recommendations that came out of the legal work group, one of which was in respect of a change to that policy, and even without us doing anything further, the policy seems to have changed or to be changing. And the second was, and it's the first of the recommendations from the group, was to try and streamline the process whereby the applicant has to deal with so many government departments and statutory, statutory agencies so as to have a single entity that will look after all of that and thereby make the ability of these doctors to come and work in Ireland all the easier because we are so dependent upon them and likely to remain so for many years to come. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am, for those who don't know me, I'm the joint chair here, uh, uh, Mr. Anand Mahapatra. I work as a senior consultant in Dublin Northeast and also a senior lecturer, honorary for the RCSI group. Um, now I'll request uh, Mr. Al Rashid to talk on career pathways. Mr. Al Rashid works as a vascular consultant in Bowman Hospital, Mr. Al Rashid. Thanks a million. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation uh, to be a part of this important work. And also thank you for the invitation to speak today on behalf of the Career Pathway work stream of this important short life working group. Maybe the only reason I'm talking to you today and being introduced as a vascular surgeon in Bowman Hospital, the fact that I came to Ireland in the good days before the color of your passport a contribution to the fact that I could be collect, selected for high surgical training. So I should declare that in addition to my role as a trainer in Bowman Hospital and the Royal College of Surgeons, I also serve as the president of the Sudanese Doctor Union in Ireland. During the coming few minutes, I'm going to summarize the talk to tell you about the contribution of overseas doctors in the healthcare service in Ireland. Also, I'm going to summarize the finding of the engagement process of this short life working group. And then at the end, I'm going to concentrate on the career pathway um, work stream and tell you about the recommendation and the output of that. So 
an important characteristic of the Irish health system is that it's unique in many aspects, including diversity and internationalism. Diversity is demonstrated clearly in the recent report by the Medical Council, which indicated diversity of gender and diversity of country of graduation. That's reflected diversity in nationality, culture, and religion, in addition to many others. On the other hand, internationalism of the Irish health care system is very obvious from the fact that many doctors from all over the world, including the all continents, were either trained in Ireland or trained in an international Irish institution. There is an increased need for doctors in Ireland, and that's due to the implementation of European Working Time Directive. In addition to the increased number of consultants need to work in Ireland, and also because of the pressure of service provision in the country. That made Ireland facing a challenge of retaining and recruiting highly skilled doctors to provide the service in the country. As you can see in this slide, Ireland has the least number of consultants per 100,000 population. And also we can see that Ireland is very highly dependent on overseas doctors and it's ranked third in the world in relation to that. If we look at the recent publication by the Medical Council, we can see that non-Irish graduate were easily registered in the general division or the supervised division. That means the majority of them will be serving as non-training scheme doctors. As many of you know, the surgical training in Ireland is delivered through the National Surgical Training Program, an eight years program. At the end of this program, you'll be provided with a certificate of completion of training, and then you become eligible for registration of specialist division of the Medical Council. If you look at the non-training scheme doctors, we can see that there was no central recruitment process for them, and also there was no formal process for assessment in place for them. However, they can still apply for the specialist division of the Medical Council following category E. In January 2021, there were more than 1,000 doctors working as NHCDs in Ireland. 64 of them were non-surgical scheme doctors, a number that's much higher than in countries like UK and Australia. And if you can look at the other slide, you can see that the majority of these doctors will be working in Model 2 or Model 3 hospitals. All that together led to frustration and significant repercussion of these doctors and the health system itself. And two reports were published in 2014 and 2019 asking for revising the issue and also asking for optimization of recruitment process and training in Ireland. Following the recommendation of this report and the need of the public health or the uh, health system in Ireland, the president of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, as stated earlier by the co-chair of this session, asked for establishing a short life working group to address this issue. So the engagement process or phase of the short life working group was carried out using survey and focus group discussion to collect both qualitative and quantitative data to highlight the issues and look for solutions. The survey was carried out using questionnaire which was distributed electronically to the people who were registered in the Royal College of Surgeons Continuous Professional Development Scheme. And we had 44% response rate. If you look at the demographic of these doctors, we can see that 80% of them were non-Irish graduate, and 91% of them has less than one year contract. <laughs> Looking at their training requirement, more than half of these doctors has no access to logbook. And about a third of them were not even aware of the mandatory courses that they need to gain the registration with the Medical Council. And 70% or more than that of them has no access to mandatory course or training 
requirements. When we ask the trainees about their satisfaction and if they think that they are treated fairly by their employer, 42% of them thought no. Again, when we ask them if they think that they are valued to the team they're working in, 22% said definitely yes and 38% of them said probably yes. However, 7% of them, they don't think that they value to the team. Again, we ask the doctors about their preference or career preference, and more than 50% of them said that they want to apply for specialist training in Ireland. And only less than 5% of them said that they want to go back again to their home country. So when we ask those doctors what your preference will be if you are not selected to the higher surgical training program in Ireland, majority of them said that they will apply for specialist registration in another country. So for the qualitative data, we carried out focus group discussion, which was delivered in four hospitals in Ireland. Three of them were Model 3, and one of them were Model 4 uh, uh, hospital. Uh, Twelve themes emerged when we carried out thematic method analysis. And two of these themes were recurring themes, which were expectation and orientation. Most of these doctors said that they believe that they would be able to access specialist training in Ireland. And also they said that when they came to Ireland, there was no enough orientation to them about the situation in the country. So, all these facts led to the formation of the Career Pathway Group as one of the four work stream of the short, working, uh, short life working group uh, in this um, issue. So, the Career Pathway. The objective of that work stream was to develop an in-depth profile of the Career Pathway for doctors appointed to non-training scheme posts in Ireland through each stage of their journey. And it meant to address four main issues. These were expectations, recruitment process, specialist division registration, and international medical graduate training initiative. At the end of the work of this short life working group, and after numerous discussions and meeting, we came out to the recommendation of developing a document that provides information on a wide range of aspects of both work and life in Ireland. The document included 13 elements. As you can see on the slide, information on the Irish health system, and that's give more information about how the health system in Ireland is run, model of care and type of hospitals, Again, also information about the medical council registration and type of registration divisions and which one to apply to, how the jobs are advertised outside the training scheme in Ireland and how you can get access to them, the recruitment process itself and the checklist that you have to go through when you're applying to a job in Ireland, immigration process in Ireland and the type of visas that you can apply for and also how to apply for a work permit, and op the operation of the surgical team in Ireland and what's your role supposed to be and how you can progress into that team. And again, advice about how to make the most of your career in Ireland, giving you information about other courses or higher degrees that you can apply to in order to improve your CV uh, to meet your expectations. And also included a section about applying for a specialist training despite the fact that it's currently um, obstructed by the fact that only Irish or EU people, uh, or not only, but the, they're the people who get the priority over the overseas doctors. Uh, a section also will be talking about the employment legislation in Ireland and the employer and employee rights, the professional competency scheme and CBD, and how to apply to the specialist division uh, following the uh, equivalent route for registration and also information about the Irish Medical Graduate Training Initiatives. And at the end of the document, there's a segment about life in Ireland, giving you more information about the housing, 
the cultures, differences, uh, banking process, and all the things that we thought it's necessary, these people should know before they can come over to Ireland. Thanks a million again for the opportunity, and much thanks to the members of the work stream, and a special thanks to Patricia Malone for the admin support. tell them about Gaelic football and hurling and rugby and etc as well. We'll need to have brochures on, on those. Thank you very much, Rashid, for your excellent talk. I should have mentioned at the beginning that um, we're going to hear all the talks first uh, to give you a full picture, and then that gives an opportunity to, to take discussions. So workstream number three is going to be delivered by Kieran Ryan, who needs no introduction. Kieran is Director of Surgical Affairs, and this is, this is going to describe um, how we can, how RCSI can help these doctors in the area of continuous uh, professional development. Kieran, thank you. Uh, thanks, James, and, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Um, I, I'm Sean Tierney was uh, going to give this particular speech to you, and uh, unfortunately he can't make it today, and he asked me to step in. So uh, hopefully I'll make a bags of it, um, and uh, and uh, get through it fairly well. So um, again, thank you. you. You've heard all the great talks, and uh, this is certainly one of the short life working groups um, that has been uh, probably one of the most important things we do. I think as a college, um, and it's sort of been it's reflecting what this college is meant to be all about. Much more inclusive, much more diverse in the way we look at all the people we support uh, and how we support them. And I think all of the various work streams you're seeing here are giving us good direction in what the college and my department in particular uh, will have to try and deliver and support everybody in their career pathways and in their training and in their development. Um, so it's, it's, it's fantastic to, to see this work uh, coming to, uh, to fruition like this and to present to you all the various recommendations that we're going to get working on over the next while. Um, so just to acknowledge the uh, members of, the, of this particular work stream, uh, Professor Sean Tierney, uh, Mr Tim O'Hanrahan, Paddy Kenny and Dr Adrinda Effendi uh, for their work on that. And uh, uh, this area is working completely at the, was the quality assurance and the continuous professional development piece. So how do we implement the various activities and the supports uh, to uh, meet all of the findings and the various recommendations and everything that we, we heard from the other uh, working or, uh, work streams as part of this working group? The main objective of the working group was to look at recommendations, how we structure uh, the, uh, the device that would validate the experience skill level of doctors, um, and the system would need to quality assure and track performance. Um, and again, this is not seen as something to be punitive or uh, to add on more uh, hassle to people in their day-to-day -day life. It's actually to give them structure and support, actually to give them feedback and actually to help them develop. And that's what we heard from most of our, uh, the workshops and from the surveys that we did. Uh, as mentioned by El Rashid, uh, an information pack, like start at the beginning, give people what they need to know before they come here, set expectations, set, set out what is actually a reality when they come to work in an Irish hospital and what supports are there available to them. So you can see we have lots of information of all of the various stakeholders and parties that are involved in this. Um, the problem is it's highly fragmented. It's hard to find it, it's hard to navigate it, it's hard to see how it all links up. We can definitely do more uh, to help with those areas. Uh, and certainly, uh, we, the forum of uh, postgraduate training bodies in Ireland uh, has done a lot of work like this already with the International Medical Graduate Training Initiative. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to kind of review it and make sure it's up to date and gets out there uh, more, more prevalent to people. Uh, one of the other areas uh, that we need to look on, if we're going to look at the uh, continuous professional development and quality assurance of, uh, of uh, our doctors in the Irish health system, we need to look at the induction programme. Um, and it needs to be a little bit more uniform and very much more specific kind of on a national basis. The largest employer of doctors, of course, is our health service executive and all the hospitals as part of the HSE. But they're not the only employers in Ireland, of course. Uh, all the private hospitals employ people as well and, and other various uh, other independent sector uh, bodies. But actually getting to a kind of a standardised induction programme on how to give, how to get doctors well set up in their first job in the Irish Health Services uh, is absolutely vital uh, to, to, to improve things there. Um, and the other areas, the Medical Council uh, a while back have put in the Medical Council Safe Start programme, which again is an excellent uh, education information programme to help people start their careers in the Irish Health Services, uh, and we'll be reinforcing the, the views there on that. 
Um, the education, then making people more aware of the educational supports that are there as they then embark on their uh, career in the Irish Health Services and in, you know, in, our, in our case in, as a, in a surgical job in particular. Uh, so RCSI, uh, over the last number of years, we've put an awful lot of work uh, in collaboration with the HSE, in fairness, they've given us a lot of uh, funding and support uh, to put these programmes in place. And our CPDSS programme, so the Continuous Professional Development Support Scheme, is, was specifically designed at supporting uh, our doctors, not in the structure of the training schemes, uh, to meet their requirements for professional development and the professional competence scheme as required by the Medical Council. And uh, that has gone from strength to strength. I think we have over 114 courses being offered now. We have, I think, 740 plus uh, uh, doctors, uh, mainly all surgeons, but we're seeing some non-surgical uh, 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 colleagues in getting engaged in this who are enrolled in this program. And that is giving uh, structure, uh, it is giving recognition to the engagement they are putting into the education programs, and it's uh, meeting their requirements uh, of, of the Medical Council to meet professional development schemes. So creating awareness of those education programmes uh, among all uh, colleagues and people starting their new job uh, is, is very important. And then there are other uh, avenues that, can, uh, that the college can offer if you want to embark on a higher degree or if they want to embark on uh, diploma work. Again, we've tried to work on uh, areas that are re relevant to their needs. We do engage with uh, our colleagues in, in, in all these uh, uh, various jobs and various specialties to understand what are their education needs. You can't just keep rolling out the same old courses over and over again. Uh, you have to keep them up to date. You have to make them relevant. You have to listen to the clinical needs that are emerging as, as practices change, uh, as the skill mix change, and so on. So we're trying to see if we can evolve our program uh, to meet all those needs across the whole spectrum uh, of the experiences that people have uh, in, in these posts. Um, the other area we're trying to encourage people to look at is get more engaged with local teaching. Um, and more an integrated and a much more uh, you know collegial approach to how teaching goes on in our hospitals and access to the uh, mentorship and the training and, and all that goes with that in, in putting that good kind of esprit de corps in our surgical teams, uh, which is really important both from uh, a, a job satisfaction perspective, but obviously from a patient satisfaction perspective, or patient satisfaction perspective as well, because uh, you know good teams deliver good quality care, and the, the the harmony is important there in the teams. So we want to look at more uh, ways that we can uh, encourage and engage the whole of the team in uh, the education that goes on at a local level. There's a professional portfolio, uh, the professional competence scheme, which everyone must enrol in, in a scheme uh, in Ireland as part of the requirements of the Medical Council. Uh, RCSI provides a, a, a good structure, has an e-portfolio. Uh, we have the logbook, uh, which, uh, you know, as, as El Rashid pointed out, uh, people struggle to get access to a logbook. That logbook will be available to everybody. Um, there are other logbooks available, of course, but the RCSI logbook is designed specifically for people in a surgical post, uh, has all the various uh, lists of procedures uh, and, and stages of procedures that you're engaged with in order to build up that logbook portfolio, which again will allow more structure and more targeted training uh, and education to people in development in their post. Um, and, and exactly the, the last point there, forming that basis for supervision, which kind of moves on to the next, I suppose, important part of the, of the work of this particular work stream. Uh, so monitoring performance. So a lot of the feedback we got as well is that, you know, in many cases, people land into the new job, they don't know who their supervisor is. They're not shown, well, who is my consultant? Uh, who is going to supervise uh, and give feedback on their development and on their performance? And it's really important that actually we start putting a bit more structure on that. So monitoring performance is not, again, seen as a, uh, another burden uh, on things. It actually is a, a, a big gap that we need to put in uh, to help develop uh, our, um, our, our, our colleagues in their surgical posts at various stages of their career. So there is no uniform national performance management system for non-training scheme doctors. Those in structured, the consultant training programs, uh, the specialist training programs, there is absolutely fantastic structure. Uh, there is a very clear curriculum, there's very clear learning outcomes, there's regular review. I mean, they're assessed uh, at, on a regular basis. That level of feedback, that level of uh, mentorship, that level of coaching, that area of pointing out is absolutely vital for everybody working in the Irish Health Services. And it happens actually across most of the other professions. And it, it's almost it's strange that it's the medical workforce that seems to have all of these gaps. Uh, we don't have that in nursing and we don't have it in the allied health professions. So it is important we work with the HSE and hospital employers to start developing uh, the, a good approach to performance 
uh, support. Uh, assessment is clearly a part of that uh, and feedback, but it's not performance monitoring, it's performance support uh, and giving people guidance on where they need to go with that. Uh, so there was lots of uh, recommendations in the report uh, that are quite detailed. Uh, again, meet a named consultant as a supervisor. Really important you know who you're attached to, uh, what is that service about, understand where your place is in the team and how you engage with the rest of the team members. Um, look at regular review and have a process by which all that review can be documented, recorded, uploaded to your portfolio in order to engage in more conversations and uh, keep, the, uh, keep you on a career development uh, pathway. Uh, the end of rotation review, I mean, our rotations can be ridiculously short, if you ask me at times. Uh, we have that issue with the six-month rolling contracts. Again, it's, it's extraordinary that uh, in no other uh, 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 professional group in our workforces have these sort of contractual arrangements. That's something I think that has to be addressed with those that are responsible for contracts, of course, uh, to see how we get a little bit more uh, continuity there. Um, so again, looking at the rotation review and facilitating that is very, very important. The professional development plan is a requirement of the professional competence scheme and the college has put in place a structure and information for uh, everybody enrolled in a professional competence scheme on how to develop a professional development plan and what the structures are like that. And there are CPD credits awarded for engaging in this whole process in order to help support your requirements. So in summary, the uh, output of this particular work stream, I think very important, building mainly on the work of all the other work streams, of course, is that you make sure people are fully informed before they land into their first job in the Irish Health Services. And that has all aspects from working here to living here. Uh, very important. Uh, have them fully prepared for the role through good induction and good access to education and development. Ensure that they know who their supervisors are and that, you know, I mean, it was mentioned this morning, I think, at the trainer, faculty surgical trainers uh, meeting, the importance of actually recognising the time that trainers have to take to talk to their trainees, to talk to people and support them, uh, is, is actually underappreciated. It is not acknowledged either contractually or otherwise in, in our health service. And yet, if we want a vibrant workforce, uh, our, our hospitals management and employers and HC are going to have to realise you're going to have to give people time to manage people, to talk to them, to develop them, to support them. So, you know, we need to keep more emphasis on that. And the college will continue to advocate for more on that uh, and I, do, I, I think there is probably a recognition of that given the crisis we're at that we do have to uh, 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 have more time for people to do that you know, people management piece uh, that's so vital. Uh, the professional portfolio and logbooks and the infrastructure and documentation and systems will be there and made available to people and ex expand more and more awareness of the various pathways and education programs and ways people can develop uh, their areas of career. So that's a quick summary. I hope I've done it justice um, and uh, thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, next speaker, uh, I know you don't need an um, introduction, Professor Camilla Carroll, council member. Um, she's a senior surgeon in Dublin Eye Near Hospital. Uh, Camilla, she's going to talk on a very important part. I mean, the whole year, or more than a year, we worked on these uh, short life working group, and it is all to do with, uh, you know, how do we deal with uh, lifetime issues and all that. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Anant, for your um, introduction. Thank you, James, for inviting me to be part of this work stream. And indeed, I see the president here. Thank you, President O'Connell, for taking on what is a very difficult issue, which has been present in our country for far too long. RCSI is committed to leading the world to better health. The Irish Healthcare Service is committed to patient safety and quality of patient care. Building a better health service requires a personal commitment to our own well being and an intolerance of toxic environments and behaviors. 
the regulator offers guidance in good professional practice, and again reinforces the need for a personal commitment to our own well-being. The code of conduct for surgeons emphasizes that very special surgeon-patient relationship which is built on trust. We now know what it takes to make a surgeon in the 21st century. And indeed, it is based on efficiency of practice, personal resilience, and a culture of wellness. RCSI has a robust surgical training program. We utilize the ISCP intercollegiate curriculum. We have competency by design. We have skills acquisition and we utilize the knots training to enhance surgical team performance. We also have self-directed learning in the management of personal well-being. The IMC have introduced a doctor well-being document last year, and again, they place emphasis on how to be at our best when we treat our patients. Surgeon well-being is now a hot topic of debate globally. Schanefeld was the first to identify causation between surgeon burnout and patient error. And currently, the US are calling for this syndrome of surgeon burnout to be declared a public health crisis. What then is the situation for doctors working in Irish hospitals? This year in January, writing in the Irish Times, Professor David Cotter, who is known to some of you in the audience, a consultant psychiatrist in the RCSI hospital group stated, there are patient and junior staff safety concerns in Irish hospitals because of poor working conditions. A landmark qualitative analysis by Professor Blonet Hayes and published in 2017 and indeed presented at Charter during Professor Highland's presidency, evaluated workplace well-being for hospital doctors working in Ireland. One third of hospital doctors were identified or self-identified as suffering from burnout. 60% of hospital doctors did not have enough time for their family or for personal lives. This college, the WHO, and indeed the EU have funded for over a decade work by the now emeritus professor, Rory Brewer, on a longitudinal medical career tracking study. The findings of this study are worth looking into. Trainee emigration from Ireland, a high income country, is related to inadequate training opportunities and poor supervision of training. Early onset burnout was identified in NCHDs resulting from work stress and bullying in the workplace. And indeed, sadly, non-EU nationals reported higher incidence of workplace bullying. 
Today, we heard from Her Excellency, Madam Amina Muhammad. She talked to us about equity of educational opportunity. Medical workforce stressors continue to undermine Ireland's ability to achieve medical workforce sustainability. And we are non-compliant with the WHO Global Code on International Medical Recruitment. NCHDs are increasing at a higher rate than consultants. Non-training scheme doctor increases are the result of EWTD. The COVID pandemic cycle has raised significant awareness amongst the general public in this country about the quality of life of our non-training scheme doctors. Ivana Bacic, when she was in the Senate, she's now a TD, a member of the Dáil, she raised the concept of fast-tracking Irish citizenship because if you don't have that right colored passport, you are going nowhere. Our colleague, Dr. Motion Kamal, has worked in this country for five years. He has been on call every Easter and every Christmas for five years. He is still not eligible to apply or get on an Irish training program. Dr. Syed Ali contracted COVID in his workplace, looking after his patients. That was at a time when we weren't very conversant about the problems related to working with inappropriate PPE in the hospital setting. Sadly, having spent three months in ICU, he died from complications of COVID. He worked tirelessly looking after his patients in the Irish healthcare service. Professor Michael Gill, who is well known to everyone in the audience, believes that nobody benefits. Untrained doctors putting in long hours to prop up the health service, our health service. Dr. Emer Nolan has recently concluded and published this week in many media platforms a 10-year experiential review of non-EU doctors working in Irish hospitals. She concludes, a junior doctor in Ireland is a dead end for many and can't last for much longer. I don't want to die as an NCHD. Working in the Irish healthcare system is demoralizing. And we go back to our minister, who I recently met opening a refurbished department in my own hospital, and we are most grateful to him, and indeed to uh, Professor McNamara with the NCPS, who helped to co-fund this facility. Minister Donnelly recognizes the vital role that non-EU doctors currently play in the Irish healthcare system, and he wants to do more to expose the non-EU doctors to training opportunities. Recommendations. Well, 
how do you improve somebody's quality of life? The NDTP have given us their recommendations in 2019. And the current director of the NDTP who spoke to us and uh, the vice chancellor of the college was at that meeting last week, uh, said that there are many um, recommendations, there are many solutions, but again, sadly, many of the stakeholders will find it extremely complex to introduce them. There's always an and finally. I know James uh, is concerned about time, but and finally, as the two-year pandemic cycle comes to a close, the cycle of brain drain, brain gain is recommencing. In July, at all the airports in the Republic of Ireland, our young, bright and talented doctors will be leaving again on their way to migrate to Australia. Coming in the indoor will be the bright, intelligent male doctors in their 30s from the Sudan and from Pakistan coming to Ireland looking for career progression, training opportunities and a good quality of life. Patient safety and quality of patient outcome. They're the reasons we are here today. For everybody in the audience and hopefully for the many people looking at these talks today and later on, do you think that the way we currently structure our workforce is best practice? Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla, for that very interesting and provocative talk. I'm sure we'll have plenty of uh, questions about that. So that completes the, uh, our four uh, work streams. Um, and I'd now like to invite uh, Professor Mike Griffin, the president of the Edinburgh College. Uh, Mike, firstly, you're very welcome to uh, Ireland and to Dublin after probably a long period away from from us, so you're very, you're very uh, welcome back. And I know that Mike uh, has a has a special interest in in this area, and indeed, um, I've kind of gone online on a couple of, uh, of of the committee meetings which you had in this area. And I hope, Mike, that this kind of that this uh, session gives you a little vignette as to where we are at the moment in Ireland in this topic in this area. And we very much look forward to hearing how things are across the way. You're very welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you, James, uh, for that introduction. And uh, I feel rather inadequate after that powerful presentation, which I thoroughly enjoyed and very thought-provoking. Um, in a, an area which uh, I am very passionate about, I mean, normally I'm passionate about the outcome of international rugby matches, and I'm a bit agitated about Saturday, not, not because of uh, Ireland-Wales, because that's a foregone conclusion, but because of the Scotland-England game that I'm getting back to at Murrayfield, I want to see us beat the English yet again. Um, but, but I... But I am, I am passionate about um, what we call SAS sur surgeons or SAS doctors in the United Kingdom. You, you have a different definition, and I'm going to uh, come to that uh, in, in a minute. Um, I think it's important to get the definitions right, because in the United Kingdom, we have uh, two groups. Uh, well, three groups, actually. We have what we call specialty doctors, and we have an asso associate specialist. Now, these are historic in many ways because we haven't appointed any of these in the United Kingdom for over 12 years. But they are still in post, and they are still providing service and treatment to all of our uh, patients in the NHS. 
We also have a much bigger group, which are called LEDs, locally employed doctors. And these are non-trainee posts. And like um, you may, those of you who have worked in the UK will remember lats and lasses and all these sort of things. Well, these are lasses, locum appointments for service, trust grade doctors, clinical fellows, and they are much the majority of these non-training grades. You in Ireland, as we've heard, for great presentations on uh, the non-training scheme doctors, which is your, your collective uh, for this group. But the reality is that they supply in the United Kingdom, in the NHS, over a third of the surgical workforce. And therefore, a third of the work um, uh, are done by our SAS group and our locally employed doctors. And they're a whole di disparate group from very junior to quite senior. And as you can see from the third line here, two thirds of the SAS doctors have been practicing for more than 15 years. After, after all, we haven't appointed any for 12. So these are really experienced surgeons uh, in our NHS. So they provide a huge amount of the care, and they are, let's face it, the forgotten tribe. We don't, they haven't been looked after. We've heard about the issues here in Ireland, and yes, it's great to hear what Ronan and John Highland and, and, and the previous presidents put together in these work streams to look at the issues, and now you are really trying to make a difference for this, this group of people. But we have to remember, they're not all just overseas doctors. They are, they are actually doctors within the island or within the United Kingdom. It's a whole disparate group. And they choose to be non-training grade for different reasons. Some of them don't want to be non-training grades. A lot of them don't want to be non-training grades. But there are choices in all of this, and I want to explore that just a little bit in a minute. I think it's important that uh, uh, we get the definitions right up to date now, because as of last year, um, we have a new specialist grade in the United Kingdom. Uh, and this was to address the restricted opportunities for progression within those specialty doctor uh, grades or roles. And so we have a new senior SAS role uh, named the specialist grade, and it has been agreed to be introduced and was introduced at the latter part of 2021 in England and Wales. It's not come to Scotland yet, but it will. And the criteria around el eligibility was agreed between employers, the BMA, and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. And those of us who uh, sat on the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, Ronan was there and I was there uh, when we finally ratified all of this. Now, all doctors practice with a degree of autonomy. All doctors do. Independent practice develops with experience and with knowledge. And the Academy guidance from 2014 explains the role of responsible clinicians and that they may be SAS grade rather than consultant. And this, this is really by, in this spe new specialist grade, by local agreement with the scope individual to the role filled and includes, crucially, admitting rights. And the colleges, that's the Glasgow College, Mike McCurdy's here, the Edinburgh College, and the, uh, the English College, are expected to help employers with person specifications for these roles. And when requested to do so, they can provide suitably trained assessors to join the appointments committee. And the, the whole issue is explained, and I've put the links on there, uh, for this new specialist grade. So, as I've said, we have a disparate group with different aspirations. I think that's important to mention, that, that this group have different aspirations for their surgical careers. Uh, but the one thing, and, and it comes back to the last speaker, 
the one thing that binds them all together is they, like us, want to do a good job. They want to come to work and they want to do a good job. They want to look after patients. They're not coming to, to just make up the numbers and just do nothing. They want to be a part of something that makes them feel responsible, valued, and, uh, and, enjoy, them, and enjoy their career. And, and this group are disparate, and those that really want, that have come from abroad, that are in the, the, the mire of looking to try to get onto the specialist register or to get onto a training scheme, are, can get disillusioned. And particularly those that come over to do, for instance, and I was chairman of the Joint Committee for Intercollegiate Exams, JCIE, and I had to, I had to go to court over um, the issue of differential attainment from these non-career uh, doctors, surgeons, who kept taking the exam and kept failing it. And why, why wouldn't they fail it? because they weren't in a training job. They thought, and the reason these came to court, was because they thought that, that what was happening was that they were being discriminated against. That because of the color of their skin, and their, they, they felt that they were being discriminated against by the exam process, whether it be the examiners, the whole process. And of course, that wasn't the case. The differential attainment came because they weren't being trained. They weren't being given the education. And we were able to prove that. It was literally, the differential attainment was between those in training and those not in training. It had nothing to do with race. And so those cases were defended. But it was very difficult and very, it made you think a lot about the disillusionment that these individuals um, were, were suffering in the NHS. And so... We have had to do something more about this. And in JCIE, what we are doing is we've looked at the eligibility criteria to take the, the exam, the FRCS, so that we help those individuals to, to structure their own training or their own education to give them a better chance. In other words, that they do the MRCS. They, they are, have exposure to courses. And, and so on. And I'm going to come on and expand on that a, li a little bit. But I think it's important that, that we all appreciate that this group of surgeons is looking for a satisfying career, uh, providing a high standard of surgical care. We must not lose sight of that. And doctors have a lot of varying, all of us have different commitments and interests. And not everyone chooses to complete the training pathway leading to specialist registration. And this may be due to domestic commitments. Uh, it could be health considerations or other interests such as, and I know so, uh, a handful of outstanding elite sportsmen and women who chose to become specialty doctors, non-career grade, because it allowed them to concentrate on their sport. Now, there may be hundreds more, I don't know, but I know of a handful of elite sports people. So that there, there are lots of different reasons. And what we've got to do is make this group feel as if they are being supported and that they're not failures or people that just ha aren't going to con contribute anything. We've got to change the culture that, that that is around these non-training grades. So for a job like this to remain interesting and fulfilling, there's got to be a room for progression and recognition. And I think that is extremely important. And so we need, therefore, to support education and a degree of training of these doctors to the level that they want to achieve and it's our college's roles to, to really support that and support the SAS and the locally employed doctors to develop and deliver that high standard of care because they want to have a high standard of care. So that's what the college, I feel, has to do and, um, uh, and to appreciate that self-fulfillment is extremely important for all of these doctors. So, what have we 
decided to do. Well, during my chairmanship of Joint Surgical Colleges meeting and then Ronan's uh, chairmanship, we agreed that we would set up an intercollegiate SAS education committee because we felt that there were potentially gaps in uh, the opportunities that are non-training grades, I'm saying that because it's simpler for, for, for you here in Ireland to understand this group, this disparate group, um, to get access to courses and education, educational opportunities. And, and this group met for the first time under my chairmanship, I'll come on to it in a minute, uh, in October. But what we wanted to do was to find out whether the educational events that were offered by colleges, which after all were mainly aimed at our trainees and our consultants, we all know that, um, were they open to our SAS doctors, our locally employed doctors, or our non-training uh, uh, career grades? And, uh, and to find out a little bit more about that and see where the gaps was. So that's what we did, and we uh, started this meeting, this uh, education committee, and it first met uh, in October under my chairmanship. The group um, had also a co-chair, lead SAS, who's um, a non-training grade in trauma and orthopedics. Uh, we had educational leads from the English College in Andananu, um, from the Glasgow College in Colhoun, uh, Sean Tierney, who's not here today, who's going to speak, um, admirably replaced by Kieran, um, and uh, uh, Aidan Fitzgerald from our college as well. We have the lead from the FSA, uh, Duncan Summerton, and we have the chairs of JCIE, hugely important, John McGregor, JCST, John Lund, who oversees training, and uh, John Hines, who's the chair of the MRCS, ICBSE. And we have representatives from each of the specialty, and these are non-training grades, SAS, LED uh, grades, who are from each of the specialty associations uh, to represent their their, their specialty. And we also have a representative from Health Education England and NHS Education Scotland. So that's the composition of the committee. And the whole idea was, was to look at what is needed in the surgical speci specialties and look at what we've got and deal with what is missing. And also to highlight ways that these grades can expand their roles out with the day-to-day -day job that they do. And the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges has published at the bottom there um, uh, some, a number of papers written by their SAS committee uh, regarding the different roles that SAS doctors or surgeons may fill during the course of their career. And that is extremely important to make their roles interesting and, and, um, and fulfilling. So the idea of this committee was to look at what we've got look at what was available to, the, to this group. Was it just for trainees or consultants? Was human factors, our NOTS course in Edinburgh, was that available and free for SES, SAS doctors to join? Well, it was. And it was extraordinary that when you actually went into it, when we got the information in, all the colleges, Irish, all of us, had the... the that all these doctors could actually get on these courses if they wanted to, if they could get the funding. Um, but where were the gaps as well? And so, um, uh, further to that, there was a lot of discussion about the terms of reference of, of what this committee would do. Uh, and we felt that it was important that we address the issues, as I mentioned before, of differential attainment in the, in the exit exam. Uh, support for CSER the certificate for eligibility uh, for specialist registration, which was the only way in the NHS that a, a, a non-training grade could then become a consultant in the NHS. Now, many of these doctors don't want to do that, but many of them do. And so what we decided to do was to look at and liaise with the Joint Committee for Surgical Training, John Lund as chair, and look at the whole, because they oversee the CESA process, and get them to input webinars, support for these individuals to, to access, to help them with their application. It is a nightmare for them. 
trust me. And just passing the exam is just a tiny part. It does not mean that they become consultants. And, and yet, they feel that it is the ivory tower. It is, once they've reached there, it's going to be fine. It isn't. And we have to develop mentorship roles for these, uh, this group of doctors. Again, disparate group of doctors, different aims, different aspirations, but we need mentors to help them uh, to achieve what they see as fulfillment. And so um, uh, that's what this committee is, done, is doing. Uh, we've met twice. We've established what, um, what is available. We estab are establishing what the gaps are, and we're going to fill them, and we're going to support the whole CESAR process. We're going to support mentorship in particular um, uh, for, uh, for this, this non-career group. So it's early days, um, but there is an increasing awareness that the surgical colleges have a responsibility for supporting what is a third of our workforce in the NHS and, uh, and who have been very much the forgotten tribe. And I think that uh, we can provide um, support for them to provide, to help them with the wherewithal to continue high quality patient care. Now, this new intercollegiate committee, um, as I say, is very much intercollegiate, all four colleges represented, and, and I think it has the opportunity of pooling all the resources and developing a coordinated resource for surgical SAS and LED grade surgeons in the NHS and, and in Ireland. And I think that it's, it's been really positive, the support that has come out uh, of the Joint Surgical Colleges meeting, chaired by Ronan at the moment, um, uh, for, for this group. And I'm really quite encouraged by that. I've been encouraged by the presentations that have come from the Irish College who have really got the bit between their teeth. And I think that that has been really, really quite powerful. And very much the last speaker who, who um, emotionally played with us. And, and actually, I found it really, really quite stimulating. These doctors feel like they're being left behind, and we have to support them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. If you stay, if you stay up there. Yeah, thanks. I think anywhere there. Okay, folks, you can come up. Thank you very much for our speakers. Um, I'll go here, actually. Um, I think we're speaking the same language, Mike, uh, from the sounds of things. We're, we're obviously on the same uh, track, um, and I'd like to thank you all for your wonderful uh, contributions. Um, so we do have an online uh, audience uh, as well. So just to once again welcome you. And what we're going to do is take some uh, questions, which will be some online questions, which uh, an ant will, uh, will take here if they're coming through. And then we'll take, obviously, some questions from the audience here. So this is open now for questions uh, discussion. Any, any comments? Michael. Um, thanks very much. I really enjoyed the uh, speeches. It's hard to know whether you want to talk with the mask on or off. Mm -hmm. just take, it off. Take, take it off. Take it off. <laughs> Just, you just take that. <laughs> so, so, in the context just, of just this problem and issue, I don't think it's possible, and I think you showed very well in, with your working group and the output, James, to divorce workforce from workplace. And surely the answer has got to come in the reorganization of how we deliver services with more major emergency hubs better elective practices, more effective cancer centers, etc. Because at the moment, certainly in this country, and I like can probably comment from the UK's perspective in terms of district generalists versus small hospitals versus the university teaching centers, in this country, it, the challenge right now is... The, the, the challenge right now is to try to staff our Model 3 hospitals effectively. Um, and um, I think that's where the rubber hits the road with this problem. Um, and I think, you know, looking at it in isolation, while I strongly support, I've always said that the concept of a non-training doctor is a misnomer, mm. that all of us are training, learning, progressing all the time. Mm -hmm. 
so that we need to put a structure around it. And I was very interested in the output from your thing, where you, uh, Mike, where you say that um, it's not just uh, that these these um, the non-training group or whatever you call the the, the setup. I, I get uh, confused with the the nomenclature, but that they're going to have independent admitting rights, for example. So, you know, what are we doing? Are we squaring a circle or, or what? But I, I do believe, honestly, that the challenge for all of us is to try and ensure that our workplaces are fit for practice. Because in the context of non-training doctors and training people appropriately in a situation where the hospital's over, overrun by trolleys and the university hospitals even, and then the Model 3. So anyway, I don't know if you've thought about that as, as, as um, a, um, part of the... Um, the game plan. Thank you, Michael. M Mike, do you want to address that? It sounded like more a question for the, for your for Ireland rather than, <laughs> than, than us. I, I can just answer the issue about admitting rights. This is a new specialist grade. There's very very few have uh, actually and vanishingly few have been appointed to these roles. They are local roles. And the, the, the rules, if you like, and the admitting rights are dealt with on a local basis uh, in the trust or the health board or the, or the hospital mm -hmm. that, uh, that is actually appointing those individuals. And there, there are strict criteria as to those individuals who are already in posts, remember, and they apply to become this specialist grade, which um, has a higher salary and it has more independence. And it is an admitting rights, and that independent practice is dictated locally rather than on a, a general and national uh, level, just to make that clear. And if you click on the, the, the links I've given you uh, with the Academy and the BMA, it is very clear about that. Camilla, you wanted to say something? Yes, and um, thank you, Michael, for your question. I know this is something that is very dear to your heart, and we have discussed and continue to discuss reconfiguration of hospital services in the Republic of Ireland, and that is the crux of the issue, as we know. We are in a very different situation to the UK NHS. In 1995, when I trained as a senior registrar in the West Midlands, the grades that Mike discusses today were in existence. I worked with many of those doctors. They have just tidied up the nomenclature and are now offering access to training and skills advancement. We are doing nothing of that here in Ireland. We are issuing six-month service contracts to people who arrive at Dublin Airport and stay and find out that this is not what they signed up for. We issued a contract to a doctor from the Eye and Ear in January. They still have not arrived, and now they're not going to come, and we have a gap for six months. That gap could be well-filled by one of the doctors who will interview in a few weeks for a select number of training places. And the rest of them will be going to St. Elsewhere's. We know the problem. We know the solutions. Let's start doing something about it. Thank you, Camilla. I think we, just to say to you, we have uh, over 80 people online at the moment. So, Anant, I think uh, you can just, if you just read yes. out some, maybe two or three for the moment. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, uh, for, thanks to Mike from Paul Valve. Uh, he thinks that it was a great presentation, and, uh, and he thinks also that one system <laughs> and which should have, uh, everybody should have an access to. Um, that's the way to go forward. Um, Can you one, say uh, Paul from me? I yes, uh, I'm sure Paul, <laughs> Paul is online. And uh, um, I, I won't take, uh, I would keep this anonymous on some of the comments that I've got here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We can see that. You, you were online and you have said something about England. I hope you're not flying through Heathrow. <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, we're, we're flying straight back to Edinburgh, very good. Uh, to, to Murrayfield. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so w w w one of the uh, trainees has, uh, has asked for um, 
retrospective uh, attainment, all these paperwork and all that, how can that be made easy? Is there anything that can be done about it? Because when you are applying for, let's say, um, any specialist grade or you're applying for to get into the uh, registration, uh, you have to then go back and collect uh, years down work. Um, maybe I'll uh, ask Justice yeah. Kelly uh, if uh, what do you think about the GDPR on this? Because I think we can only hold data for so long. Well, how long have you got if we're going to talk about the GDPR? <laughs> <laughs> you have two minutes starting from now. Yeah. <laughs> um, th this is an area that's constantly <laughs> the subject of discussion amongst the legal fraternity. And I doubt if you'll be able to find anybody who will be able to give you a definitive answer on it. Um, but certainly, insofar as your own data is concerned, and your endeavor to try and reproduce that at some stage in the future with a view to advancing your career, it's difficult to see how that would fall foul of any of the provisions of the GDPR legislation. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you. President? <coughs> Professor. Well, thank you. I, what I wanted to say was probably... We'll just give it the, mic the microphone that's coming. Thank you. What I wanted to say probably would be more appropriate at the end of the discussion, though I do understand that we're close to the end of the discussion because of time constraints. This is such an important topic. I am delighted it's been aired so eloquently uh, today. And it's not going to go away. We are going to have to find solutions. Uh, these are our colleagues. Our health service depends on them. And we must do better by them. And we have started the discussion. I thank all of those who took part in the Short Life Working Group chaired by James. And I sincerely hope that in the coming year and two years that we will see improvements in the quality of life for these individuals and the quality of care for the patients they look after. Thank you. Thank you very much, President. I think you, you said what were going to be my, my concluding remarks. And uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, I think we should end because we, the next session is, is virtual as well, and we have to keep the time. So I'd just like to thank our five speakers. Firstly, thank you so much for your uh, excellent uh, contributions to my fellow co-chair, uh, Anant. I'd also like to thank members of my Short Life Working Group who, who finished the work who've done uh, tremendous work, and to Patricia Malone, who's here, who has done all of the work, really. Thank you to Patricia. And yeah, I mean, I'd like to echo what, what, what Ronan said. Uh, uh, this is a comment to you, uh, to you doctors out there. I mean, we had a meeting last year where I think uh, Rita Doyle, who was the past president of the Irish Medical Council, said that these are our, these are our doctors, uh, these are our colleagues, these are our friends. I remember those words. Uh, uh, and she says we must do, mo do more. That was the comment from her. So I think just to conclude that uh, you are our colleagues, you are our friends, and we as a college hope to do more. So thank you very much for attending. Um, can I take this opportunity to thank uh, President Ronan uh, and the Short Life Working Group. It was uh, fantastic working with all of you. And thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.